Ah. Oh, he's muted. Yes, sir. We did. Yes, sir. We are live. Yeah, you can start. Okay. We are ready to go? Yes, we are ready. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Good evening, everyone. Good morning here in the U.S. Um, the discussion today is visual issues in the autism spectrum disorder. And what shouldn't we miss? There's so many things that um, are, are, we look at every day in um, our visual exam that are related to autism. And what I want us to do is then bring this up to a, um, a level where you don't miss those things whenever you're doing a routine exam. Now, um, let's see. There we go. I have no financial disclosures. Uh, I sometimes wish that companies were processed <laughs> paying, but they don't. And so I'm, I'm good with that. However, as a foundation, I do trust the process of development, and I believe vision is a critical influencer in this process. So not only is it an influencer, it's an instigator. And, and I think you'll see as we go through how much I really, uh, how much emphasis I really place on the processes of vision in all of life, but particularly uh, people outside of, of eye care are using visual criteria to assess early diagnosis of autism. Autism is a very complex phenomenon. It's increasingly common. It's a developmental disorder that includes problems with social interaction, communication, and ranges from mild to disabling in severity. Most kids on the spectrum, though, have very unique and awesome abilities uh, in specific areas, but they're not always socially acceptable. I think if you've examined kids on the spectrum, you know these kids not, cannot do some of the things that you ask them to do during an examination, but they can do math, they can do other things at an extremely high level. Now, how, how often do we see uh, autism? Well, prior to 2010, the statistics said it's one in 1,500 kids with autism. Then in the CDC in 2012 said, well, now we've identified one in 150 children that has autism. And that then that's when they included Asperger's syndrome and other high-level, uh, high-functioning kids on the spectrum in there. CDC is the Centers for Disease Control based in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, in 2013, one year later, they said it was one in 88 kids had uh, links to the autism spectrum. And in 2020, just two years before, just before, just as the pandemic was starting, the, the rates increased to one in 54. And that is very significant. Um, one in 34 boys and one in 144 girls. So it's more prevalent in boys. Um, 44% of these kids have IQ scores in the, uh, in the average to above average range. So I think we need to keep that in mind as we go through here. The, these kids that we're going to be talking about are not the kids that 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 are, are loud and boisterous and you can't control or they're toe walking and hand flapping. They're these kids that, that if you uh, bring them into the exam room and sit them down, they're, they look very typical, but they are very atypical. The causes are multifactorial. People keep trying to pin one particular cause for um, uh, autism. Uh, you know, it used to be um, that that it was um, uh, the the preservatives and the vaccinations they got. There are many others, but there are many causes, and and some of them probably there are multiple causes for a single case. Um, published in 2019 in the Journal of the American Academy of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, they found ophthalmic disorders in 71% of the children with ASD, that's uh, autism spectrum disorder. Um, so there's 71% of the children on 
uh, the spectrum have ophthalmic disorders. But one fourth of all the kids on the spectrum are undiagnosed, and that's from 2019 in, in autism research. So you've got all of these kids that they're undiagnosed likely because, again, they're higher functioning um, and, and, and they can contribute to society, but they're not uh, performing at the level that, that, that we would expect. Lynn Press and Jack Richmond published uh, 13 years ago, The Absence of Eye Contact, Unresponsiveness to Facial Gestures, and difficulty in sharing joint visual attention or signs of abnormal or atypical vision development. So their abnormal or atypical vision development, but then we go back and what are the symptoms, signs and symptoms of kids on the autism spectrum? Absence of eye contact, unresponsiveness to facial gestures, difficulty in sharing joint attention. So there's a really, really high link, as you can see from all of these that's there. And there are many, been many other publications, but, but uh, Lynn Press and Jack Richmond were the first to publish on this in, in optometry literature. What are some of the indicators? Um, the early indicators of, of risk are, are related to vision, but they aren't noticed. But uh, during routine testing, um, because they do respond, but the pupillary reflex, we'll talk about each of these more depth later. Blink reflex, gaze following, in other words, how do they follow your gaze? Attention, ocular motor function, choice of fixation object, and then slower binocular rivalry. And some of these are, are, are just coming out more and more and more. First started seeing the some of these things that they were using uh, very early uh, in the 2000s, 2001 or 2002. But more and more and more, these are, are being indicated as visual links to the autism spectrum. They're things that we test every day. So we already test those things, but I'm going to give you little indicators. Now, the first clue is parents often ask, why don't they look at me? And, and so, you know, if there's a lack of joint attention, the, the child is not looking at the parent. So the parents will say, well, you know, they just don't seem to look at me, and I wonder if they can't see. Well, the best way to induce anxiety in children with autism is to insist that they look at you. So be very careful about insisting that, that the child look at you. It makes them anxious. And one patient said, I can see you or I can hear you. Which do you want? So this was a smart young, young person, young patient, that's already recognized that I can either tune in visually or I can hear what you're saying and answer your questions, but I can't do them both at the same time. But the parent observation is that they're not looking at them and, and they will many times bring their face to look at them. And now they're looking at them, but they don't hear a word the parent says. Uh, there, there are adults on the spectrum who have indicated they become overwhelmed by the intensity of looking further uh, involved in the spectrum and less amplitude and less change as the group as a whole. So 35% of the children on the spectrum show an improvement in language and social interaction when they had a fever. So again, here we are. Uh, uh, these kids get a fever. I'm not sure that I can understand this, but but these these the, the, they show an improvement in language and social interaction. So not only do their pupils show a more typical response, social interaction improves and language improves. So this was presented at an international meeting for autism research in uh, 2010. Um, here's now another one. In 2017, from autism research, 17% of the children with autism are calmer and more communicative than usual when they have a fever, according to a new analysis. Calmer and more communicative. Children with severe autism features are most likely to show these gains. So, again, contradicting a little bit the previous study, they show that even with severe autism, these kids are more likely to show the gains. Now let's move on to just blink reflex. 
we watch them coming in and we watch them. We know that as as we begin to focus on something, we reduce our blink, blink reflex, of blinking stops, because now we're attending. However, typical to- toddlers inhibited their blinking earlier than toddlers with ASD. In other words, um, the, the typical toddler, as soon as you bring the target in front, they begin to open their eyes and decrease the, the, the frequency of blinking. And it happens earlier than kids with ASD. And so the kids on the spectrum don't open, don't fully anticipate what's going to happen, and they're not watching as carefully. So these, these findings indicate that measures of blink inhibition, in other words, it's, it's not a, a, um, a conscious effort, but whenever I start looking, I don't blink as often. They're useful quantifiers of atypical processing of social affective skills in toddlers with ASD. If they don't restrict, inhibit their blink and don't begin to look and engage, it's a possibility that, may, that they may be on the spectrum. So we don't take any one of these things and say, oh, well, that is... Um, um, that's it. They're on, they're autistic. But when the, you start seeing more and more and more and more of these things adding up, we see that they don't follow the gaze. We see that they have a blink inhibition. We see that they don't respond to people air light reflex. We sh- our antenna should go up and we should say, hey, this kid, we, we need to follow them more carefully. This are from the proceedings of the National Academy of Science in 2011. Um, really, really looking at that. So my pearls on that is when we're looking more intently in so, at something, the blink rate decreases or temporar- temporarily stops. Watch the blink rate. Because in kids on the spectrum, this doesn't happen as frequently, and it's longer to, to begin to inhibit that blink rate. What about gaze development? Looking and following gaze. That infrequent, self-initiated, socially directed gaze may be an early marker of later social and communicative disease. This is from a Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. If they don't initiate the social gaze to look at you early, early on, may be a marker of later social and communicative delays. Well, what are social and communicative delays linked to autism, kids on the spectrum? And they are, uh, the title of this is Social and Non-Social Visual Attention Patterns in Associative Learning in Infants at Risk for Autism. So we're talking about in our examination, these kids who are at risk. You expect the child's gaze to be self-initiated in a social situation. In other words, we come into a social situation, I immediately begin to look and I look people in the eye. When this is less frequent, it's an indicator of child on the spectrum. The study suggests that a broader autism phenotype, which includes atypical response to direct gaze, is manifest early in infancy. So they're finding this earlier and earlier and earlier, which is the need which uh, we found when we found it infancy. That that's, all of these things relate to how do we identify these kids who have difficulty. And if they don't do this, are there guidance activities that we give the parents? Yes. And are there things that we can do to help them before we even think putting this, the, the autism label on them? So again, we're talking about eye gaze processing, and, and that uh, happens. Atypical gaze is manifest in early infancy. That's not something that that begins to happen at two or three years of age, which unfortunately, when many kids are diagnosed. Um, Another article, uh, findings suggest that although gaze behavior at six months may not provide early markers for autism as initially conceived, gaze to the mouth in particular may be useful in predicting individual differences in language development. So gaze to the mouth may may predict Uh, differences in language development as opposed to gaze to the eyes. um, One of the things that has been uh, linked to autism is they don't look at you in the eyes. They always look at you in the mouth. 
Well, that may not always be the case, as this article suggests. But when they don't look at you in the eyes when you're talking, it is a, a potential issue. Uh, this, this is, uh, again, um, uh, cognition. Eye, eye contact does not facilitate detecting children in autism, whereas detecting, typically developing children have the ability to detect direct gaze. Children with autism do not. So this might result in altered eye contact behavior that hampers hamper subsequent development of social and communicative skills. Well, when these get to be, kids get to be two, three, four, five, and six, that's when they begin to put the autism label on them. And I think what's happening is so many, one of the reasons we've seen this significant increase in the frequency from one in 1500 to one in 88 to one in 54, is they're beginning to identify these kids earlier and earlier and earlier. So eye contact is crucial in achieving social communication. We, we don't just hold our head down and carry on a conversation, a good conversation with uh, another individual. It's important that we look them in the face, look them in the eye when we're doing that. Deviant patterns of eye contact behavior are found in individuals with autism who suffer from severe social and communicative deficits. These results reveal that children with autism were no better at detecting gaze than detecting averted gaze, which is unlike normal children. Now, I have a slide that will show this in just a second, but, but, but again, the, the kids on the spectrum have difficulty telling the difference of whether or not you're looking directly at them or whether they're there. According to the research, um, the current biology, uh, brains of typically developing six-month-old babies react differently to images of facing looking toward them than through those looking away. The brains of babies who are later diagnosed with autism, however, show little different. So that happens It's a, uh, early on, and then there, here's, a, here's the slide that I was telling you about. The one on the left, looking directly away from you. The one on the right, looking directly towards you. Typical kids look at the image on the right almost 100% of the time. They want the eye contact. Kids on the spectrum make no differentiation between looking at you and looking away, and oftentimes will look more at the one looking away. What happens to the image on the left for a typical child, they're going to look to see where you're looking. So that's called gaze following. So they take it on up to, from gaze aversion to gaze following to see where you're looking. So there's such a difference just in pictures of, of looking like that. And I mentioned gaze following. If they actively follow a parent's gaze, in other words, without a parent saying anything, they're looking at a particular target on the table. If by 12 months of age, the baby looks to see where you're looking and follows your gaze to that same target, by 18 months, they'll respond to 335 words. Remember, they don't know those words and can't say those words, but they'll respond to those. They know, they know the words, but they just can't speak and communicate the words. 335 words by 18 months of age. If they don't follow your gaze by 12 months of age, the parent's gaze, or another, uh, other patterns, they only respond to 195 words by 18 months of age. So in six months, we see the kids who follow the gaze, remember that, that um, those two images, the one directly looking and, and the one averted gaze, they will follow that. If they do that by 12 months of age, look at the difference in words they respond to. So by 12, 18 months of age, we already have language differences in kids, in communication, potential communication differences in kids um, who might be on the spectrum. And then Brooks and Meltzoff did that in um, 2005. They repeated that a number of times, but that's the initial one where they actually put in the, the words. So if a baby can follow your gaze and know what you're looking at, they'll have better language skills by 18 months of age. Again, what's one of the characteristics of being on the spectrum? 
four language skills for a father. It's not, these are, these are not just simple findings that we see at 12 months of age or 18 months of age, two years or four years. These findings can be the start of a cascade of developmental and behavioral issues that could last a lifetime, whether they're on the spectrum or not. Now, what they also found was Brooks and Meltzoff have, have, have extended, and that's where the two years and four years came. Those kids that only responded to, to um, the, the difference at 18 months of age was also carried into two years of age, and they responded differently on tests there. And then at four years of age, as they're getting ready to go to school, significant differences there also. So this is not just something that happens here at 12 months of age or 18 months of age. This carries on throughout all of development without intervention. It's so important to identify early, see where they're looking, and begin to make sure that you engage them visually, whether it's direct attention, if that can be managed, or indirect attention. Make sure they can do that. Uh, here's one that... Um, uh, I found uh, earlier, and uh, gaze aversion is a cognitive load management strategy in autism, uh, ASD, and Williams syndrome. So gaze aversion, if they have to look at you, that adds to the load that they have to uh, uh, control and manage as they look at you. So uh, looking away is a load management strategy. So in this thing, low risk groups are more likely to have normal social gazing or typical social gazing. Infrequent self-initiated social directed gaze may be an early marker and later social and communication delays. What about attention? Oculomotor abnormalities might play a causal role in functions known to be impaired in autism, such as imitation and joint attention. Imitation is one we haven't talked about. Um, but but this is, um, uh, we've seen this article before. And now they're even saying ocular motor abnormalities might play a causal role in functions with autism. They used head-mounted uh, eye tracking to record the gaze data for, for both parents and infants. And they found that infants extend their sustained attention to an object when a mature social partner also showed Again, like gaze following, they're attending, they're engaged, they're looking. And, and whereas um, uh, a, a kid on the spectrum may not record that. So encourage all parents to initiate looking with their baby from very early. What about oculomotor function? We've talked about that. Although atypical eye gaze is commonly observed in autism, Little is known about underlying oculomotor abnormalities. They might play a causal role in functions known to be impaired in autism, such as imitation. So we just said that, and here we go again, talking about eye movements and eye control. They may play a role as a sensory motor defect at the root of impairment. So we're using all of these more definitive words that we talk about but they are very, very characteristic of some of these kids on the spectrum. So the result in that. So these are two articles again, where the bottom one is repeated, but now we've got eye movement uh, abnormalities in autism. And so these uh, have been going on for uh, recognized for 10 to 12 years now. And it's important that we do that. Um, this study used eye tracking to develop uh, examine 20 month old toddlers who were determined to be showing autism spectrum disorder, typical development, and non autistic developmental delays. So, that they had three, three uh, characteristics here, uh, three different groups. First group was on the spectrum, second group had typical development, third group had developmental delays, but they were not perceived to be on the spectrum. And I thought this, this study really shows the differences there. Um, they monitor the activities and the child play. Partners with the spectrum in comparing to the other two control groups showed less attention to the activities of others and focused more on background objects like toys, et cetera. While all groups spent the same time overall looking at people, toddlers on the spectrum looked less at people's heads and more at their bodies. So we have a, 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 a kid on the, that's showing a developmental delay, but it's not autism. 
they react here almost as if a, as, as a typical child does. So we're beginning to differentiate. It's not just a developmental delay. They're separating it out for these on the spectrum. So in, in uh, ASD, these patterns were associated with cognitive defects and greater autism severity. So there, the, I, I thought this was very, very um, uh, revealing. Monitoring of social activities of others is disrupted early in the developmental pro progression of autism, limited future observational uh, activities. Most authorities now believe that subtle signs of ASD are present under 12 months of age. You remember many of these that we've been seeing. And eye tracking technology has been used experimentally. Those are things we do every day that people outside of eye care have to have special machines. I'm glad they have those special machines because now it's just my sub, not my subjective response. It's, it's these machines that track eye movements that do that. Um, they used infrared light to follow baby's eye movements. They watched a series of movies showing just geometric shapes moving around. And that helped to successfully diagnose children with autism at just 12 months of age and only minutes instead of hours. So that rather than spending hours in testing, they just watch the baby's eye movements. They watch movies and separate the kids that are typical and the ones that are neurotypical or those on the spectrum. And though they looked at uh, uh, fixations in four regions, mouth, eyes, body, and objects. Fixation times on mouths and objects, but not on eyes, are strong predictors of a degree of social incompetence. The best predictor of autism was reduced eye region fixation time. You look at your patients when you walk in the room, when you're doing an examination, do they look back at you and how did they do that? Um, again, archives of general psychiatry. Um, the team found that when babies were not being engaged, those in the high risk group spent far more time, more time gazing at the toy than the caregiver. So once the little test world was over, they didn't continue looking at the person. They continued looking at the toys, unlike typical babies. Um, this is from the Kennedy Krieger Institute. They are not as socially interactive, engaged as their own, on their own as peers. In other words, when left to their own devices, they're not as engaged. Infants later diagnosed on the spectrum exhibit mean decline of eye fixation from two to six months of age. It's so important to identify early. Infancy, we recommend seeing these kids starting by, at, at six months of age because this is a pattern not observed in kids who do not develop that. By the time they reach the second birthday, levels of eye fixation among children with autism are only half as high as levels seen in typically uh, uh, developing children from nature. Developmentally delayed and typical developing toddlers had more difficulties disengaging their visual attention from the faces than toddlers. In other words, we remember we talked about the three groups. Typical babies continue to look at the, the, um, the, the tester. Those with developmental delay tended to continue looking at the tester. Those with uh, uh, ASD tended to look away. And that uh, was not present in response to non-facial stimuli. So it's more in the facial ca category. These results suggest that toddlers with ASD are not captivated by faces to the same extent as toddlers without ASD. And that effect is not driven by a generalized impairment of disengagement of attention. So they're not captivated by faces to the extent that typical or even the kids that are typical uh, uh, but on developmental delay have that. So this is from the archives of general psychiatry. They're using these characteristics to identify kids on the spectrum that we look at every day in our examination. Instead, young children with autism look less at the eyes because they appear to miss the social significance of eye contact. The, the, they're not developing the social significance of being able to look at that. Again, American Journal of Psychiatry. Results reveal that children with autism know better detecting direct gaze than averted gaze, which again, they, they, they like we saw before, altered eye contact behavior. 
So this is from cognition. So it's not just one or two or three articles. Multiple articles are now doing that. And it's so important to look at that, uh, uh, look in the eyes of others. Our results indicated that our two-year-old children with autism, this behavior, behavior looking in the eyes of others, uh, is already derailed two years of age. It's critical consequences for development, but also offers a potential biomarker for quantifying syndrome uh, manifest, manifestation at this early age. Archives of General Psychiatry. Here's uh, current biology. Caregivers whose eyes wander during playtime due to distractions, such as smartphones or other technology, for example, may raise children with shorter attention spans. So if you've got a child, uh, talk to a parent. If you have a child who is already, you see, might be on the spectrum, do not use your phone, your iPad. Do not use things that distract you from engaging them uh, during playtime. It's so important, so critical. And, and, and so think about that. Caregivers whose eyes wander may raise children with shorter attention span. And that's typical children, not children on the spectrum. Something so simple ensure that they look at you. Eyes and looking are so very closely intertwined in the early stages. Diagnosis of autism is delayed by about three years in children diagnosed with ADHD. So if their kid's already ADHD, I think one thing feeds on another and, and they just become uh, overactive. This was from pediatrics in 2017. So here's the top nine signs from uh, autism site that your child have autism. This is what they give to parents. Lack of smiling by six months of age. You know, where does smiling come? That's, a, that's an imitation. Rare imitations of social cues. So other imitation of social cues. Social cues. Pointing. Gestures. Very, very important. Delay in babbling and cooing. We can listen and watch and see how they do that. They, the kids just talk and chatter and do. unresponsive to name. You call them by their name. They don't look at you. And frequently seeking attention within the first three months. Lack of gesturing by nine to 10 months. Repetitive behaviors, in other words, echolalia, talk of repeating those things, or just delayed motor development. Those are the nine things that they find. I'm not suggesting that eyes or visual issues cause autism, although a couple of articles did. They're beginning to see more and more some of these things cause. I think it's more related and linked. I am suggesting that earlier signs of autism are prevalent in visual function assessment. And this is often overlooked because we do simplified testing. We depend on uh, screenings at school, at the pediatrician's office, at the medical caregiver's office, and they don't address those things. Lack of eye recognition. There are significant visual issues in the autism. Lack of communication to others that are there. So look early, look often in the special uh, difficulty. Start with a careful history. Does anyone in the family have issues? You know, I had a, a, a crazy sibling. Um, place particular emphasis on eye movement and control. So really carefully look at following eye movement and objects in the room as you test. Are they looking more at the target, at you, or at some other thing in the room? So carefully evaluate their behavior. Refraction is generally not the primary issue. So don't spend a lot of time on refraction. Take your retinoscope. If the eyes are, look equal and they're there, fine. It's very, very similar to, to looking. Binocular function is present. Binocular function is present. The chances improve for having a foundation for looking. So if kids with good binocular function will, will be less likely to be on the neuroatypical. Um, pattern of response. Watch the speed and quantity of movement in doing pupillary reflex. Blink with, with reflexes. If you give them something fixate on and they stop blinking, that's more typical. Whereas if they don't stop blinking, even though they might follow, their attention is not there as much. And that's more atypical and again, stereo assessment. So what do you do? If, you, if something is amiss, do you immediately diagnose autism? I would recommend not. Do you refer as fast as you can? I think it's not best at the very first to alarm parents. 
You start looking earlier, definitely. It's too late for the child sitting in their chair if they're three years old. Start at six months of age. Start as early as you can. However, however, it's not too late, really, for the child sitting in the chair because that's the first entry. You have the child. Now let's start and go from there. I would initiate activities at home to get them to look and if they are looking and following and are not looking and following, give the parent guidelines. I have guidelines that I give them. So just give them or tell them that, tell the parents, we're seeing some things with the child, sustaining attention, sustaining looking. I want to give you these activities to do, and I want to see you in a month. That, a lot of those are dependent on a recent diagnosis of what the family expects the perceived severity, whether the findings change in a month. So if they come back and now in the month, they are very much in more engaged and looking, then we don't have to worry about the autism nearly as much. If they haven't changed, then we need to begin to get community resources involved. But most importantly, don't panic. It's not necessary for you to make an immediate diagnosis of autism. In fact, I would steer away from that. Work with community resources, but know who they are and what they do. Emphasize the concerns, not diagnosis, that you have to the parents and the need for follow-up. I'm seeing difficulty following. I want to work on this. We give the, these activities to do at home. I want you to work on these, and I want you to see them and follow up with you. It's okay to monitor without alarming the parent. It's not necessary to begin a, an intervention for the spectrum. Until it's determined the specific prescribed eye movement activities do not change the looking behavior. Um, I have one that a visual delayed visual maturation that uh, I talk about. So here's some activities for the, for parents. Get the babies down in their tummy, tummy time. Babies don't like it necessarily, but it's necessary. Place things out of their reach. Look at your baby when you're feeding, when you're changing. Any other time when the baby's awake and alert, look at them. Don't leave eye contact a chance. I see parents, uh, my, my parents, I did used with my kids. I used follow the airplane or the spoon or whatever and got eye movements going when I was doing that. That was before I even knew that, that I was going to be an optometrist. Don't leave that eye contact a chance. Now parents do. Tummy time involves engagement more than just being on the tummy. Now, this is not effective tummy time. Dad on his phone while baby's down on the tummy or mom's on computer while uh, baby's down looking. So these activities for parents, put down your phone, place toys and other objects just within reach or later outside of reach. Encourage looking and moving. So you're not talking about facial, uh, con uh, facial engagement here. You're talking about putting things they like outside of reach. You think something's amiss, initiate activities to stimulate looking patterns who are diagnosed or not. Look early and look often. Remember, it's one in 54. Work with community resources. Develop a list. Monitor without alarming the parent. Have a short time frame for follow-up. A lot of people say, well, let's see them in a year. No, nah, we want to see them. I, I see them may, maybe as often as four weeks, but maybe no more than three months. Have resources handy. In other words, when they come back in, already have your autism uh, the, the organizations in your local area that work with kids on the spectrum, have those ready for referral. It's to initiate activities and monitor more frequently. Encourage the parents to be engaged, especially if they're not. Make visual activities a part of daily activities. Continue to follow them on a frequent basis, yourself or in concert with the pediatric conference. If those symptoms persist, begin that consultation. Don't just refer and think things are settled, that they're going to take care of the, autis uh, the, the, the autistic thing. They still have vision problems that you need to follow and monitor. So work in communication, collaboration with those other organizations. The sig significant difficulty in ocular motor control, optometry must be involved. There's a number of websites, uh, Autism Information Center for the Centers for Disease Control, Autism Research. See, most of these things you can, can um, uh, um, access internationally. Autism Society of America. Um, there may be autism societies in, in uh, regional areas, you, but you can always uh, access those websites. Autism Speak, 
KennedyKrieger.org. All of these people are willing to share. Too many individual blogs to mention. Just it's, it's open access to things on the Internet. So determine if there are any local resources. Don't panic. Traumatic for the parent, especially if there is a diagnosis of autism. That's traumatic. But it's not life and death. Become a trusted resource for the parents, even if you're not involved in the eventual treatment. You may not offer services, but you can find resources. So I want you to feel free to contact me. This is my email address. I hope that I've linked so many of the things involved in autism spectrum disorder and diagnosis to the things that we do every day. And I want to emphasize the importance importance, the significant importance of what you do every day in your practice. You have resources to help these kids as they go through their life. And um, I would encourage you to get involved with them. If you do nothing more than just share, 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 share. And with that, we're going to stop the share. And we'll see if you where All are. right. Thank you so much, Dr. Steel, for such a wonderful uh, presentation. I hope all the uh, optometrists, whenever they get the autistic patient, after this presentation, they will be confident, and uh, he, this presentation help uh, to you know how to deal with the uh, special type of uh, population. So now it's time to go for the discussion session. Okay, Doctor, are you ready to take the questions? Sure. Yes. So uh, let me share the uh, my screen. Okay. So are you able to see the questions? Uh, my uh, my screen, doctor. Yes. Yes. So uh, I have the first question uh, from the Solu Gautam. So thank you so much, uh, Soluji, for your question. So here here goes her question. Dr. Estil, thank you for the wonderful presentation. My question is, how can we approach to the patient with the autistic, uh, uh, autistic um, autism to have a better response? I have a few examples. Uh, patients are mad at me. So. I, I, I would, would start out again. Uh, most of the time when I do an examination, I position myself directly in front of the patient and get them to look. Position yourself outside, and I don't know if you can see me or not in there, but if you if you uh, can can share that, um, but if if you if you position yourself to the side, you you're less likely to make them mad at you. You these, these kids remember communication is not a tool they use. Communication should be a tool we use, but it's not a a, a tool that these kids use. And so they, they already have a problem with communication. So if they do that and then you position yourself right in front of them, you, you tend to make them mad at you. So you have to vary your typical um, uh, way of, of positioning yourself. And so um, they, that, that is one particular area. You might even have things. I sometimes sit on one side of them and I will have a, a hand puppet on the other side. So they don't have anything directly in front of them. The target I want them to look at is on the opposite side. So let's say I'm sitting on the child's right side, I hold a, a, a hand puppet up on the child's left side. And, and so I begin to see, do they look at that and how do they follow that? Uh, but it's not directly in front of them, like I would do with the typical child. I'll be right there where I can see their eyes in position. But if I see they're getting mad or upset with me, I move out of the way and out of their line of sight so they can fixate on the target rather than me. Something that just very simple as that uh, can, can start. Now, there are times whenever the the parent has tried to get the, the child to look at them before you come into the examination room and they're already on the verge of being mad. Uh, it's, it's more important uh, that, that uh, and one thing I've learned is to go ahead 
even if they're not on the spectrum, to position myself outside of the direct straight ahead view. It, it seems so simple. It seems so simple. But but just get out of their way of directing. Okay, uh, thank that, you so much, Doctor. Now we have another question. Okay, so here here is the one question from the VUS Media. So uh, he or she is looking for the recommendation of any antioxidant supplementation consisting of uh, perinatal thiathione and vitamin A, E, and E. I don't know is this related to this topic or not. But this is I found in the YouTube uh, you, uh, from the YouTube. So uh, there, there. Uh, I don't generally um, with this presentation recommend that, and I generally don't do that. However, I don't object to doing that. I want to to uncover every resource possible for um, children who have that. But I, I have a, um, a dietary specialist that I, I refer to locally, and um, uh, it, that's very helpful um, to, to get involved with. I don't do it, so I don't like to talk about things I don't do. <laughs> All right. All right. So thank you so much, doctor. So we have a question from the uh, Asmita ma'am. So Asmita ma'am, maybe you can uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask question. Uh, to the doctor is still directly if you are compatible yeah Aspen, ma'am are you here I, yeah i do see one in the uh, the 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 chat there kids with yeah. poor sitting tolerance would, wouldn't like a typical clinical setting would you share some instances how we can work on finding out these basic opt optometric parameters i am <laughs> My wife worked with me in the in the practice for a number of years, and, and I have students working with me. And there are many times, the first thing I do is I get down in the floor. Um, I work with the kids from getting them down in the floor brings a comfort level to them. I have even done uh, examinations in the reception or waiting area. Uh, I go out there to them rather than having them come to me. Um, it, it's not unusual to get a kid who, uh, a typical kid, who might be afraid of, of an imposing, I'm, I'm not a tall man, but, but even at my size, uh, um, it, it's, it's, it's threatening to them when I walk in the room. So I do little things like I, I had a door that squeaked, and I would slowly open the door and the door would say, eh. <laughs> And I would just sort of peek my head in. Well, what do you do? First of all, that gets them to looking at the door. Now they're looking at you. And now you begin to close the door. And I play peekaboo with them. I'm outside the room while they're in the room. But again, that's for kids who are more typical. Some of these kids, you just need to get them down on the floor. And it's okay to put them in their more natural environment. Um, that, that, that's the first thing I do. Okay, so let me check if there is any question. All right, so it's one more question from the uh, wrinkle, sir. So maybe you can read on the chat. Uh, yeah, chat can, you, can you share some simple, simple validated tests to measure eye contact so we can research under scientific basis? If eye contact improves with working uh, different visual issues in children with autism. Um, I, what all of the the um, validated measures of eye contact generally um, are in research facilities. They're expensive, um, and and uh, if if they're local to you, then you might refer them for that. Um, I. I look at two things whenever I'm doing an exam. How do they follow my target, whether it's the end of my finger? I generally use, um, I don't have one, uh, I'll use this. I, I generally use a target that has a contrasting tip on it and see how they look there. 
So what I'm looking at there is, do they look? Do the pupils come down? Do they focus? But I'm watching with my retinoscope. And, and I will see many kids who will look at the target, but they'll be, uh, show me a diopter, diopter and a half of with motion, which means they're not focused on. I'm seeing with some of these kids who are, are um, uh, not on the spectrum, but using digital devices a lot, that they have extremely large pupils and they don't respond to an accommodative target. I have some concern about these kids in the future. This is off the autism uh, 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 lecture, but but these kids have di are destined for difficulty in the future. Uh, so just look at all the characteristics and and make make notes, uh, even draw pictures. But when you've got an eight millimeter pupil and it responds a little bit with motion to accommodation, but you don't get the pupil size, note that. And, and I used to see maybe one or two a semester on, on, uh, with patients at the college. Before I retired, it got to where it was five or six a day. And these are kids who simply are on the device just almost all day long. It's hard for them to put it down. And even whenever I turn to record something, they pull the phone out and they're working, they're playing games on their phone while I'm writing down the findings that I see. That That's a kid who's, who we really need to get control of that. I've got a whole different set of things that, that we talk about there. But, but use more than just looking and following. Use your retinoscope to observe, not to find a refraction, but just do they focus? Does pupil sizes change? And again, in our clinic, we worked with, with uh, kids with dark eyes. And so with the pupil, it was hard to tell uh, because we're also working in more reduced illumination. So it's, it's hard to tell. Watch what happens as you do that. All right. Yes. So there is another question from the yeah. ma'am. So maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but what kind of response is expected in children with ASD? One of the things that, that we see with them, remember, even just going back to pupils, if they don't fully, fully focus. In other words, whenever I take my retinoscope, and I do have my retinoscope handy, whenever I take my retinoscope and I watch, not move, don't move it, just hold it still and watch what happens. Then I hold a target up. And what do I expect on a typical child? I expect them to focus on the target. What kind of motion do I expect? I expect neutral motion. I don't expect to, to see a uh, variable motion. I don't, with these kids on the spectrum, the motion is variable. They can't look at the target and they can't sustain looking at the target. So that that's um, the the um, the first thing and a primary thing uh, uh, that I use. And there was one other part of that. Do I prefer binasals on those kids? Um, I haven't used binasals. I've used binasals in kids with esotropia and some in exotropia, but I have not used binasals in kids on the spectrum. Uh, I might like to share that, uh, have that shared with me sometime if you found that to be uh, effective. Um, I'm open to anything that makes it easier for these kids to function in life. But I, the, the, the real um, impetus for our lecture today is we have a great, great deal to offer kids on the spectrum. And it's just stopping and, and taking a look. All right. So thank you so much, doctor, uh, for your insight. I guess we have answer all the question. So if anybody have any question still, so maybe they can uh, directly mail to Dr. Steele or yes. uh, they also can mail to us, will be uh, forward to Dr. Steele. So e I e guess we either have- Either way will be fine. Yeah. yeah, yes. So lastly, lately there is a one more question, maybe <laughs> two more question. So would you like to address uh -huh. or you want to from the mail? Um, yeah, that would be my, the, if the child doesn't really follow object, can we conclude he has poor saccades or, or pursuit? Um, absolutely. 
Um, and, and, but that's why I want to be careful in saying, oh, well, let's, um, uh, let's, let's get him on the spectrum. Just because they have four pursuits and saccades does not mean that they're on the autism spectrum. Uh, it, 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 but, but it can become one of those one in 54 um, that, that they um, uh, will later be diagnosed as being on the spectrum, but it may be a high functioning that is misdiagnosed. And if it's misdiagnosed, then that's why it's important for us to be there. I would ad- definitely address the four saccades and pursuits. And, and if you address those and they improve, chances are pretty good they're not on the spectrum. If they don't improve, then you might want to. Um, another question, any color or frequencies that can calm ASD kids down? Um, I'm, I'm not aware of any. I know there are a lot of people that work with color. Um, there are a lot of people that work with syntonics. We, we know color has an impact. I think the, the issue is finding out the specific color that might help those. But I don't know of any um, specific color um, that that can calm those down. Um, not saying there's not. I'm just saying I'm not aware of it. Um, another question, how do we infer the visual information processing skills objectively? Um, I don't know that you can do that objectively. Um, what what I want to look at is I don't set the guidelines for what's expected in school. Teachers do that. But but what I set the guidelines for is do they have the, the functional visual ability to look? And again, remember, I'm working for uh, I'm, I'm working with younger kids. Um, um, so it, it, it's it's a little bit different than working with school age kids. But uh, what I want to look at is do they have the ability to look? to focus, to sustain their focus. And I, I categorize, it, categorize it in five areas. Number one, do they look? Do they look? Number two, do they attend? Do they continue looking? Number three, do they focus? I do that with my retinoscope. Number four, do they identify? And identifying means not just I can tell you that that's a, a finger puppet. It means I want to continue uh, on to engagement in that, and I want to play with that. But they will sustain their retinoscopy reflex throughout. I find retinoscopy, using your retinoscope to identify how these kids are engaged in the younger ages, is a precursor and, 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 and let you know how they're going to follow through with that engagement as they progress on to preschool onto school age, onto life. Zero to three says a child's uh, school readiness begins at birth. Now think about that. School readiness begins at birth. What I, want, what I say then, if school readiness begins at birth and the school is so important to everybody, life readiness begins at birth. So I am am very much uh, uh, of the um, belief that the things we do every day in our practices prepare these kids for school and for life. We're not the only ones working with them, but I want to prepare them as from the visual standpoint. Now, I also say vision is an influencer. Vision is an instigator. If there's anything beyond where I can reach, I have to do it visually. That means things on the chalkboard. That means cars when I'm driving. That means anything I have to do to sustain, even in things that I reach. Vision is a primary, primary part of all of that. I want to make sure they're ready. They don't have to be perfect, but they have to be ready. So... All right. Any other questions do we have? I guess we have answered all the questions. All right. So, uh, 
Uh, come across here's here's one more comment though. Um, come across a lot of kids who have had regression with their communication abilities. Do they have similar regressions in terms of their mastered visual abilities too? Um, I, I don't know, but I would certainly look and see. And I think that many times, particularly kids on the spectrum, sometimes everything developmentally is going just according to plan. And then they start regressing. I think there is often a, a, a visual regression too. So that's a very good comment. And, and I like that. I think those, those regressions, but you don't know that unless you see them early and they are typical. And then you see that they have decreased in that. Um, the, those, the visual abilities are so critical in life. I, I, if I can do nothing more than make you proud for the things that you do every day with your patients, um, I, I've done my job for, for today. So um, please um, do that. All right. So I guess we have answered most of the questions, doctor. So maybe by the time limit, we have to conclude the uh, discussion session. So rest of the question, I definitely forward to you and uh, you can meet in free time. So is okay. that okay? <laughs> all That's right. fine. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. So almost we are at the end of the session. So before ending the today's session, I'd like to again uh, express my sincere gratitude towards uh, the presenter, Dr. Stilser, and all the attendees. Also, I'd like to appreciate all the helping hands for the iTalks webinar. Herewith, I am ending the today's session, requesting all of you uh, to drop your review and feedback. So before uh, ending the today's session, so Dr. Still, if you have any good notes or anything that you want to uh, wrap up from your side. Just remember how important you are in every child's life. That 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 is so critical. We we have something to offer that the whole world it's it's the best kept secret. What we do every day is the best kept secret in the world. Uh, no matter where you are, so feel important. Feel uh, that that you have something to offer. Yes. So thank you so much, doctor. So by saying this, we are ending the today's session. Hope to see you all again in the next coming webinar. So thank you so much. Have a good day. Okay, still. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you. You do too. Bye-bye.